Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Ferrana Petrone, assistant professor at uh, University of Nevada, uh, Reno. And my talk today is going to cover the assessment and uh, validation work we have conducted over the past few years in parallel with the generation of simulated ground motions across computational domains of increasing size and uh, complexity. Uh, besides myself, the team working on different aspects of this topic included uh, postdoctoral scholars and graduate students at UNR, uh, Majid, Arsam, and Peshman, as well as scientists at the Lawrence Livermore and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, just uh, Dave uh, Arben. Um, part of this work was supported by the uh, DOE through the uh, CSER program and by uh, PEER. Now, uh, validation methodologies, uh, and we ever heard just great presentation yesterday just on this topic, but in general, validation methodologies differ substantially, depending on whether we want to validate uh, simulations for historical events or not historical events. Historical events are great, so they really provide a ground truth for just our validation studies, allowing to perform an inspection of the motions uh, station by station uh, to really just compare uh, seismogram waveforms, wiggle by wiggle if you want to, and eventually to utilize uh, with confidence ground motion models that are well constrained. So what extremely helpful to inform and support the refinement of simulation methods, the update of velocity models and uh, source models, Really, uh, these methods, these uh, validation efforts cannot be easily generalized to the case of not historical events, for which uh, records from consistent events are scarce or not available, ground motion models as a result are not well constrained, and the expected characteristics of the ground motions, the simulated motions, need to be inferred from the knowledge we have of the uh, geologic, geologic structure and the uh, uh, rupture model. So from a structural risk evaluation perspective, we are uh, particularly interested in all those events that are potentially highly damaging to the built environment. And so we really refer to all these uh, events and just ground motions from large magnitude earthquakes recorded at short distance, from which, as you know very well from this very popular plot, the database of real records is extremely sparse. Now, the task of validating simulations for not historical events becomes even more challenging if we think about regions for which we don't have data, as you have heard, just heard from Arben, but where we do expect a large magnitude earthquake to occur now anytime, which is really the case of the just Hayward Fault in the San Francisco Bay Area. So in this context, we have just early on uh, developed and proposed a methodology and corresponding acceptance criteria to really provide an objective means for assessing the realistic character of uh, simulated ground motions specifically for not historical events. Now, this methodology counts uh, four separate steps, and it starts with step one, with the selection of population of real records consistent with the simulated scenario. And really here, the objective is to enable the uh, assessment of the structural responses is obtained from real records and simulated records to really understand whether there are uh, systematic dependencies of uh, infrastructure response parameters on ground motion, model, on ground motion models and uh, 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 data uh, variables. Now, um, in step number two, we then uh, start comparing the statistics of some simple distributions of intensity measures uh, as obtained from real records, simulated records, and ground motion models. Then in step number three, we extend this comparison to a simple infrastructure response proxies. And then finally, in step number four, we compare the distribution of uh, infrastructure response as obtained from the real records we have selected in uh, step one and uh, from uh, simulated records. So across the steps, especially step two through step four, we uh, then assess the quality of these comparisons by defining acceptance criteria. And here you see, you see a general expression of, we utilize for this criteria, but in the concept behind this uh, equation is fairly simple. We utilize the hypothesis testing and uh, with the idea of understanding whether the differences we see in the distribution of intensity measures of infrastructure responses can be attributed to the uh, randomness associated to the finite size of the samples we necessarily deal with with the ground motions or with the inherent differences in the characteristics of the, uh, of the motions. So overall, this four-step methodology and corresponding acceptance criteria have provided the overall framework for the uh, evaluation, for the assessment of ground motions generated across uh, computational domains of increasing size and complexity. 
So we uh, started fairly simple with uh, an idealized rock basin domain, and in this specific case, we focused on the analysis of the uh, motions in the near field region on the basin side of the domain. Then we moved to the uh, San Francisco Bay Area generation one uh, simulations generated ac across the, this 30 by 80 uh, computational domain. And currently, we are working on the assessment and validation of the uh, San Francisco Bay Area generation two simulations, which are um, generated across this uh, 80 by 120 kilometers computational domain. Now, in the next few slides, I'm going to quickly walk through the uh, four-step methodology with examples of application of this uh, methodology across these different computational domains. And then I will focus on some uh, selected analysis we're currently correct, conducting on this uh, San Francisco Bay Area Generation 2 simulations with some insights that we want to uh, just share. Now, uh, methodology, starting from step number one, so remember here the objective was to obtain a population of records, real records, real ground motions, consistent with the simulated scenario. And we shortly realized that while this was fairly uh, straightforward for computational domains with a simple geology structure, it's the idealized rock basin domain, Certainly, this was way more challenging for the San Francisco Bay Area, which is characterized, as we have heard this morning, for a, by a much complex uh, just geology structure. And so as a result, we uh, just uh, proposed a method based on the definition of uh, upper bound and lower bound, so limits in the uh, PSA predictions to inform a uh, range of variabilities for the selection of real records. And uh, the parameters we have considered for this are the moment magnitude, the faulty mechanism, the depth of the basin, and the shallow shear wave velocity. Now, um, another just interesting, not really surprising uh, element that emerged from this analysis was that, was that in addition uh, to having a small population of records, usually this population of records are dominated by just a few events. And usually Chi Chi and Northridge, especially if we're very interested, of course, in uh, large magnitude events recorded at short distance. And so in treating the uh, variability resulting from, the, from this uneven sampling of the ground motions uh, of the uh, earthquakes, uh, we utilize the uh, linear mixed effects uh, model. And as a result, we obtain corrected prediction of the uh, intensity measure amplitudes we're interested in. For example, here I'm showing the spectral acceleration and the corresponding variability, for which we consider both the between events and the within uh, event uh, term. Now, um, at the end of this step, so we have a population of time histories that we can utilize to perform fully nonlinear time history uh, analysis and then just eventually compare structural responses. Now, in steps uh, two and three, we start looking at some uh, key uh, ground motion intensity measures and infrastructure response proxies. So here, uh, as an example, in this plot, I'm showing the uh, spectral acceleration and how the spectral acceleration of the uh, simulated records compares with the um, spectral acceleration of the real records, this uh, uh, solid line, and the uh, uh, ground motion models, this dotted line. So, and the blue lines represented the uh, rejection boundaries of the acceptance criteria. So, as long as our black lines are within the acceptance criteria, according to these methodologies, we believe that the ground motions, the simulated ground motions, possess the realistic character we want to verify. And so, for example, if you look at this solid line here, just pretty much with the entire bandwidth, so we are within the acceptance criteria. However, we also notice that around four seconds, uh, the, our black curve tends to be uh, closer to the lower bound of the, the acceptance criteria, pointing, of course, to a lower value of the spectral acceleration around this bandwidth, around these periods. But uh, also, since we're looking at the phone rock component, this can be indicative of a lack of impulsive uh, just character of the motions in this direction, with uh, just influence potential uh, important uh, implications on the structural response assessments, especially for structures that are uh, uh, influenced uh, by just this characteristic of uh, the ground motion. Now, this same type of analysis was then extended to uh, multiple uh, metrics, ground motion metrics. Uh, for example, we considered the uh, polarization, which is important when uh, just analyzing uh, 3D structures, or the interperiod correlation, which tells a lot about the quality and the um, realistic character of the spectral shapes. And for example, this is particularly important when we are interested in uh, analyzing structures uh, whose response is dominated by the, is controlled by the contribution of multiple modes. For example, here we did this type of analysis for a 40-story building, tall building uh, structure, or for example, for the uh, West San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, so long span suspension bridge. And then we have extended this, for example, to uh, uh, the uh, uh, ground motion significant duration. 
Now, um, so at the end of st steps two and three, we're really just really able to uh, develop an informed uh, judgment on where the simulated gram motion may exhibit limitations and where they uh, can be used with confidence. Also pointing to something, something very important, which is the uh, an application-specific selection of the metrics we want to utilize for this validation and also an application-specific utilization of, the, of these motions. Now, uh, finally, in step number four, we start looking at the statistics of the uh, structural response. Remember, as obtained from the population of real records we have selected in step one and the population of uh, simulated records. And so here we start looking at some uh, just simple uh, just distribution. In this case, we're looking at the correlation between the spectral acceleration and the uh, peak uh, building drift. Uh, so then we start looking at some just very key uh, uh, values, uh, for example, the uh, median value uh, from the two sets of records, the standard deviation. And once again, we make sure that the, the prediction we obtain from the simulated records are within the acceptance criteria, even in terms of structural response. And then finally, we start looking at this type of plots, where for a 40-story building, in this case, we look at the distribution of the demand along the building height. So in this plot here, this uh, black line represents the median uh, demand uh, as obtained from the simulated records. And once again, the blue lines represent the acceptance criteria. Now, you will notice that just we perform pretty well here on the topper, uh, uh, upper portion of the, of the building. But as we just you know, approach uh, floor 25th and just uh, uh, below, you will see that uh, the structural response had to be more towards the lower bound of the acceptance criteria. And if you recall, uh, so what we observed earlier, so this correlates pretty well with the uh, spectral characteristics of the, the, the simulated motions around the fundamental period of this 40-story building, which was about just four uh, seconds, which remember also points to a lack, a potential lack of impulsive character of the motions in that direction which we know translates into uh, lower demands, especially in the lower part of tall uh, structures. So overall, uh, just at the end, when we apply these full methodologies, we're really able to uh, develop, develop a full understanding of how the identified characteristics in the ground motions can potentially reflect into the structural response assessment. To really just provide an informed, uh, just application-specific utilizations of uh, just all these uh, motions. Now, what we've done, we have then extended this same type of methodology to the uh, ground motion generated for the San Francisco Bay Area generation to uh, simulations. And in this case also, we uh, took a step forward and decided to assess, identify what are the implications when we utilize uh, set specific simulated motions as opposed to real records in AC7 compliant approaches for uh, structural design. And here I'm showing the case of a three-story reinforced concrete building. So the maps that we see here represent the distribution of the uh, demand at the regional scale as obtained from uh, when utilizing real records on the left and simulated records on the right for the two separate components, for normal at the top and for parallel at the bottom. So when you look at these maps, so the first thing you will notice is that for the uh, results obtained with the real records, there is really just a distance-dependent variation of the damage with values of the peak interstory drift, median drift, that uh, just decreases as we march away from the fault. On the other hand, when you look at the results, again, still um, site-specific um, site and uh, code compliant, obtained with the simulated records, you will see a much more scattered distribution of the uh, demand. We peaks uh, of the, uh, in the peak interest drift ratio that are recorded sometimes at uh, just six or eight kilometers uh, just away from the fault. Now, the first thing, I mean, these this maps demonstrate that uh, the capability of the ground motion, the simulated ground motion is to enable true site-specific analysis and even when we utilize code compliant methods, methods. But then when we just look at these maps, we started really just looking at some stations, some sites that caught our attention because we were observing differences in the responses much more pronounced in one direction than in the other. And so here I'm showing the example of this site A, which is located right on the tip of the fault. So we notice in this case that the response that was obtained in the full parallel component was very, very smaller than the response in terms of difference between uh, real and simulated than the response obtained in the full normal component. And when looking at the corresponding spectra, the same side from the real records and simulated records, we realize that consistent also across multiple sites, we tend to see a much more polarized uh, response, much more polarized um, ground motions in the full normal component, whatever we are in the vicinity of the tip of the fault, where we do expect to see uh, just uh, larger effects of the forward directivity. And um, so overall, this, this type of analysis and study uh, just uh, highlighted the importance of 
looking at all these results or the simulations as a cloud of points in terms of medians, in terms of statistics. But at the end, we also want to be able, before utilizing these motions, we want to look, we inspect possibly these stations, try to understand if for each case we can correlate the physics behind this problem with the characteristics that the ground motion are exhibiting, which may not necessarily be reflected in the corresponding population of real records that we are uh, just uh, utilizing in our design. So now, um, generation one, same type of approach, same type of analysis is being extended currently to the uh, San Francisco Bay Area uh, generation two uh, simulations. And um, here today I'm going to focus on a preliminary set of 20 uh, uh, realizations. Uh, you have heard a lot about the uh, rupture model and uh, the, the simulations from uh, Arben uh, and from uh, Dave. So we're not going too much into det details, but I want to highlight a couple of points here, elements that are just important to uh, just interpret some of the results that we are observing. So uh, first, for this initial preliminary uh, subset of 20 realizations, we are looking only at um, rupture models with the hypocenter located either on the uh, southern side of the fault or the northern side of the fault. And second, uh, um, among this uh, just subset of realizations, we have uh, selected pairs of realizations with, uh, we, which we define mirrored meaning that they utilize the same exact uh, rupture parameters in terms of um, slip distribution, rise time, and uh, slip rate, but the only different for the uh, point of initiation of the uh, rupture. And here I'm providing one of such examples, so realization, realization number two and realization number seven. Now, um, so the first thing we did when we uh, just received this uh, just full set of realizations was to uh, just analyze the aggregated gram motions for the full domain and across all realizations. And with respect to some key intensity measures, so we looked at the uh, just PSA and uh, PGB. So here on the left, I'm showing the comparison between the median uh, PSA obtained from, uh, for each realization across the entire domain and the uh, gram motion models, showing, as you can see, just a fairly uh, good, uh, just like a pretty satisfactory uh, agreement. You will also notice that uh, for this specific subset, we observe a very small uh, variation, standard deviation, which is really attributed to the uh, just correlated nature of the just rupture parameters that were utilized for this specific uh, subset. Then on the right, I'm showing the uh, just variation of the PGV as a function of the distance. And here, each, each dot represents uh, the median results from one station across 20 realizations. And then the uh, lines represent, once again, the uh, uh, prediction of the ground motion models. And the black dots represent the uh, median uh, at sites for the PGV at site equidistant from, equidistant from the fault. Showing, once again, just a pretty good agreement between the median value when we just really homogenize and average all these values together across all realizations and the full domain. However, sites that just caught our attentions were, of course, the sites here just falling either above or below the ground motion model's envelope. And so starting from this observation here, we decided to uh, de-aggregate this problem. And we decided to start looking at the realizations one by one. So here on uh, the left, I'm showing the full domain with the distribution of the uh, just shear wave velocity, uh, mm, the VS30, uh, according to the USGS uh, velocity model, the version of what uh, we just heard about this morning. And here on the right, I'm showing the same type of plots where we have the variation of the PGV as a function of distance for three selected realizations, so R1, R2, and R7. And once again, the uh, just color code in, it just uh, indicates the uh, just uh, VS30. Now, uh, in this plot, you can really just pick the color, the cluster you prefer, but what you will notice is that going, for example, from realization R1 to realization R2 for the same cluster of stations characterized by the same or very small variability in the VS30, you will see differences in the average prediction of the PGV by, uh, by about three times. And so same thing, for example, we consider this cluster of stations, which correspond to these stations in the Pleasant Livermore Valley with a median VS30 of 390 meters per second, with predictions that fall here for R1 and fall here for R2. Or if you want, you can just project the same type of considerations for considering this cluster of stations here, yellow stations, corresponding to this uh, portion here of the domain. So starting from these results, and looking at these results, so we decided to uh, simplify and deaggregate this problem even more. We didn't intend to uh, try to isolate and help interpret the uh, influence of site conditions, rupture directivity effects, and rupture model parameters on the prediction and, uh, of key uh, intensity measures. And so we subdivided the full domain into subdomains um, 
following the AGES criteria set forth in the SC7 for defining our site classes. And so as a result, we obtained uh, just five different separate subdomains that you see are represented here. And currently what we're doing, we are, we are analyzing for each realizations of the ground motions uh, subdomain by subdomain. And so I'm going to show you in the next slide an example of how we are now looking and try to interpret the, what we are seeing from these simulations. So here I selected two uh, realizations, a realization two and a realization seven. In realization two, looking west, the IPO center is located on the southern side of the fault, whereas in realization seven, uh, again, looking west, the IPO center is located on the northern side of the fault. And once again, these are mirrored realizations, meaning that all the rupture parameters here between these two realizations are identical. Now, in this first row plot, I'm showing uh, the variation of the uh, PGV as a function of the distance. And whatever you see this um, light blue color, that means that those, the PGV for those sites fall above the envelope of the gram motion model. So whatever you see this pink color, that means that the prediction falls below the envelope of the gram motion models. And then uh, in this bottom row, I'm showing the uh, spatial distribution of those stations in the computational domain. So something you will notice when you just look at all these uh, just subdomains, I'm showing just three here and just both realizations, is that all the stations where we tend to see an overprediction of the uh, PGV are stations that are located in the forward directivity direction. You can see this consistently again across all subdomains, of course, whatever you have in that subdomain stations in the forward directivity direction, and particularly when we look at stations that are in the vicinity of the tip of the fault. And this is, for example, the case of subdomain number four. So you will see here, just we have all this, this full cluster of stations where we have an over prediction of the, uh, of the PGV, and this is where we expect to see the most pronounced effects of the forward directivity effects. And if you look at the corresponding plot at the top, so we see that the median PGV is well above the uh, gram motion models envelope. So, Kurt, and when we look at the edition seven, so we can just kind of mirror the same type of considerations, considering can be here, for example, for the same subdomain. So, the majority of the stations exhibiting a PGV larger above the envelope of the gram motion models, once again, are in the forward directivity direction. Now, currently, so what we're doing, we're extending the same type of analysis to. Um, all the other realizations, we're also just adding uh, just uh, gram motion models uh, uh, that in explicitly incorporate the uh, uh, rupture directivity effects, as uh, just Roberto Palucci was also mentioning, suggesting uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, with the idea that eventually we want to uh, then aggregate all these results again and really just provide data that can be fully just interpreted even when we have just deviation, important deviations from the uh, current gram motion models. And so, uh, one last element I want to uh, share with you, uh, like a challenge we are facing when uh, validating, assessing, assessing these ground motions, has to do with the uh, um, sites located here on the western side of the uh, Hayward, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, on the western side of the Hayward Fault, which are characterized by uh, um, uh, soft, uh, thin layers of soft sediments with uh, just a median uh, VS30 of 100 meters per second which is outside the range of applicability of the gram motion models we are utilizing for this uh, portion of the validation study, and also is below the uh, just minimum shear wave velocity resolved by the uh, simulations. And so, uh, in the framework of validating these motions, but also in the, with the intent of providing guidance to engineers on how to correctly utilize these motions, even when we have these limitations in the resolution of the, of the, uh, uh, of the computational domains. So we have explored uh, the possibility of utilizing a hybrid method, where we combine simulation and empirical models. And for doing this, we have utilized uh, um, um, uh, two benchmark runs. So one uh, run in SW4 that was resolving just a minimum shear wave velocity of 500 meters per second, and another one that was resolving a shear wave velocity of 250 meters per second. And then we correct the uh, model with the 500 meters per second with the empirical factor uh, to obtain a target shear wave velocity of 250, so to have a com consistent comparison. And here I'm showing the results just for one single site in the Santa Clara Valley, this one here, but this same study was extended across the entire domain. So something we uh, consistently notice across all these sites is that the ground motion, simulated motion, so the 250 versus the 500 meters per second, tend to give uh, just pretty much uh, similar uh, amplitudes uh, in terms of spectral acceleration were at periods longer than three seconds. 
Whereas whenever we correct with empirical models uh, our ground motions with the 500 meters per second, we tend to obtain spectral acceleration that are much larger. With important implications, we will see in a second on the uh, just, uh, assessment of the infrastructural response. And so really this points to something important and the fact that the San Francisco Bay Area, and in particular this uh, just portion of the San Francisco Bay Area, really is a unique in terms of uh, just velocity structure. And so this thin layer, so the way we just interpret this uh, just um, similar spectral acceleration is that the, thin, the layers of soft sediments are so thin that not, they not allow that build up of the waves, long period of waves, and then would reflect into just larger spectral amplitudes that we see here when we apply empirical models. And so just to give you a sense of what would be the uh, just misestimate of the structural response uh, when we utilize blindly to some extent the uh, uh, empirical models, here I'm showing the uh, um, distribution in terms of ratio of the demand post to a 3D 10-story uh, uh, reinforced concrete building as obtained from different uh, modeling approaches. And we see differences in the demand that go up to a factor of two. So overall, this really just points to the uh, a cautious use of the empirical factors for regions with uh, geological structures that are not well represented in the uh, databases of historical records, as just the case here of the uh, just San Francisco Bay Area. And also additional challenges that we face when we uh, just um, uh, uh, validate these motions. So in conclusion, um, a lot of lessons learned just across this entire project and just still a lot of work to do. So uh, something very important we've learned is that the importance of establishing a feedback loop with seismologists, which was also something Arben was referring to, to inform potential updates to simulation models and simulation methods, which should be based and must be based on uh, studies, validation studies that look at multiple metrics and also look at the implications of uh, 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 limits on our simulations, on uh, uh, limitations we find in our simulations on infrastructure response assessments. From the um, perspective of a structural engineer, uh, we realize that it's very important to provide together with the database of records also metadata that it provide clear guidance on the appropriate use of these ground motions. Uh, for example, in terms of ma maximum result frequency and what will be the, imp the uh, implications, consequences of using, for example, for just uh, very stiff structure motions that do not resolve those frequencies. Mini motion velocity, as we were just discussing, or the incorporation of learning realities. We have heard the great presentations yesterday about the work that is ongoing to just incorporate this. It will be important to really just explicitly know what is the method that's been utilized for incorporating nonlinearities. And then, of course, evidence from uh, validation across multiple metrics, keeping in mind that we don't necessarily expect to check all the box when we just validate and assess our simulations. But of course, we want to check those boxes that are related to the response of the structure we're interested in. And finally, current work is extending the application of the proposed validation methodology to a larger set of empirical models, including non ergodic models, and the incorporation of uh, uncorrelated uh, rupture models, as Arben was just uh, mentioning. And I will stop here and be happy to take questions. <laughs>